Good morning, everybody. Welcome to my Governance, Risk, and Compliance course, a special uh, uh, version this week. Uh, it, it's dedicated to the C-Risk. So normally this GRC class um, covers uh, just basic governance, risk, and compliance uh, that, that's applicable to C-Risk, CASM, CASSP, and, and many other courses. But I wanted to focus this week on the C-Risk because I'm getting a lot of demand in 2022 as the, um, uh, the exam was updated and, and I don't I'm not, I can't really explain why I'm getting so many calls. So I, I've been focused a lot on it. And uh, we're going to play with it like this. I, I just ran a class about three weeks ago. I know some of you are from that same organization. I don't want to mention names are back here. Uh, and, and we played with the new format. So I'm going to loosely follow this format. Where day one, we're going to understand what our, you know, what, what's our role? What exactly are we doing here? Where am I? <laughs> what are some of the things? Who are our customers? Who works here? Who do I go for help? You know, what happens? What's my job? And then um, uh, uh, we're going to start doing our job on, on uh, day two. And, and, and we start applying, oh, well, then here's what I'm here for. You asked me to, to uh, help you control risk. All right, day two, let's, let's, let's put them in. And now that I know what I want or what you want, and then we're going to have problems. So it's like in day one, I'm, I'm researching a car. Day two, I start driving it. And day three, I have to deal with problems. So uh, generally, when we respond to, you know, a problem in, in an operation, the operation of your car, there are little things, you know, little things. I just got new tires. Oh, I let them go a little late, but I just got them over the weekend. Walmart great prices on tires <laughs> and uh, uh and they put them in on on a saturday in like 40 minutes i couldn't believe it anyway so that's a small problem we have to maintain we have to patch our servers and stuff like that do routine maintenance but we also have two big categories of big problems uh, and these are uh, uh we're going to use the terms uh well we have to continue business no matter what Disaster recovery is when um, something just happens. Like, you know, there's, there's nobody intended anything to go wrong. It, it was uh, whatever. It was a, a snow storm or, or Bob accidentally hit the wrong button. Disaster recovery is for natural disasters and man-made accidents. But incident response is man-made intentional. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about it. It's, it's very important. We see, you know, uh, you know, as a, as a parent and one of my children are here, I'm honored to have my uh, my daughter who graduated college last year and and, and uh, uh, started a business that helps me. Thank you, Martine. So I'm, I'm one of her customers, and uh, I worry about the, the the crime. You might turn on the news and see some things. We're going to stick with something very simple. Um, we know it through something testable, especially CISSPs, crime prevention through environmental design. It's in the environment. Uh, some people will commit crimes because they want unfair advantage over their competitors. And it's it's like the guy who's playing football with you, but it's going to cheat. You're like, dude, you're breaking the rules. And he doesn't want to get caught. They try to evade cameras. Man-made intentional things when people are trying to get unfair advantage. If you put up a, a camera or start logging their activity, the risk of this happening goes down because when people do stuff like that, they don't want to be seen but some people we see it all the time just they don't even care if they get uh, they, they get shot up you know suicide whatever you know we see these gun it's horrible these are because of disgruntled employees disgruntled people and the countermeasure is to gruntle them we're going to try to make people a lot uh happier today uh this week we're going to realize that you know we, we watch the news and there's a virus going on right now I, uh, peter diamandis calls it cnn constant negative news you turn on the news, it was originally there to, you know, we're going to see from Lloyd's of London, it was supposed to provide us information about governance, because, you know, when you govern your ship, you know, the risk is there, the, the cliff is there, that's what the word means, it's cliff underwater, that's what the word comes from the Greek, but the wind blew you into it, there was a big storm, we need the news, at first, the, the weather, I need to govern today. I need to, I made a map of, of what things normally look like, but I need to know up-to-date information because the weather's always changing. That's what news was. It was originally the weather. First electronic news. It was what pioneered the internet. That's what Lloyd's of London Insurance wanted ships to get radios with Morse code as soon as the technology came out to mitigate governance, you know, steering the ship, crashing into the cliffs. Um, but today, that's not what it is. Today, the news is mostly there to sell you whatever 
gutter helmets or something. So they just try to grab you. And we're, we need to we need to get over that. And we're going to see that how that works. So that's a lot of uh, what Peter Diamandis is, is a, uh, one of the, for me one of the greatest uh, writers alive today. <clears throat> he points out that uh, in in some wonderful books, abundance. The future is better than you think. If you look at the data and not just CNN or whatever news channel, they're not the only ones, uh, you realize life is actually much better than it's ever been. <laughs> it's just, it's not even close. When I was a boy, it was not really that nice. <laughs> so, um, he, you know, when there's only enough water to go around for like the mountain and the valley people live close to each other, they're neighbors. They would like to love that neighbor, but there's only enough water for one of them. They got to compete. What else can you do? That's part of survival, survival of the fittest. You got to compete. Um, uh, but if there's enough water for both, and there is now. And did you know the mountain people, have, they have the best jelly. And the valley people, they make the best peanut butter. And information security requirements in a time of abundance, survival of the fittest means you're a person or a business of integrity. Is that jelly exactly as you said it was last time? I'm going to create a hash on that and make sure. And of course, you know, cloud technology, is it available? I mean, what good is the jelly if it's not? I, they actually had it at the Walmart, a cheaper tire. Uh, oh, I forget the brand, but whatever the case, it had a good, a, a, as good a rating, like 2,000 reviews, four and a half stars. And it was uh, 96 bucks, but they were unavailable. So it was useless to me, but I did get it still well rated. It was 120 for a good year tire. It was very, and uh, so that's more important today. Encryption today, we're going to cover a lot, does give us confidentiality. But if you've been following blockchain technologies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, whatever, that's not what it's for. The purpose of crypto ledgers and stuff is to provide integrity, and it's changing the world. My mother taught me that if you only learn from history, and she felt you should, but she pointed out you're only going to be getting his, not hers. That's a bias error. We only recorded men's opinions. That's why she felt we had to have like witches and stuff. Yet, Larry, it's because the women's opinions of things, the things that they thought were smart, were not allowed to be recorded. Who are you, some woman? And she also pointed it's not all men, the winner of the last war. <laughs> they rewrite it. You can't trust information that came from competition. <laughs> if, if the Eagles are playing Dallas, they do not supply information about what they're doing. In fact, they're going to lie. They're going to use trickery. Why, he made it look like he was going to run, but he threw the ball. This is what we need to know about, and they know a lot about this on the, on the test. The, um, the C-Risk updates are wonderful. Actually, I, I, they blew me away, I will admit, uh, because there are some basic risk management practices that I didn't know because I only knew IT risk. Now, that's just some terminologies and stuff, but we'll talk a lot about what my, there were like 20 questions related to uh, particularly um, the, the three lines of defense. I'll plant the seed now that I don't remember before. And the other one was uh, um, a lot of questions on when you update the risk register. So I want your guys' opinion. And what's really funny about the risk register is um, uh, when I went to look for examples, and if anybody here is using software for it, I would love to know. Because whenever I look at it, right, show me, what, how do you build a risk register? They're all like Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> it's like, oh, here, you want to download my Excel spreadsheet? I'm like, 2022 Excel? Oh, uh, well. Now, how do we correct these bias errors? Make sure we get women and men, and not just the men who won the last war. We want men from all, not just European, whatever. We want everybody's opinion. We're putting cameras up everywhere. There's cameras, and people are worried, dude, they're, they're always on camera. Alexa's always listening to you. One of my favorite scientists, uh, Martin, by the way, I got a funny story about this. Uh, this, Rana Akayubi uh, wrote a book called um, uh, uh, Girl Decoded. She is the uh, CEO of uh, Effectiva. Uh, it's a, a software company that, to build emotive AI. Um, her book is one of my favorite books in the last five years. And um, I, I'm trying to get my 17 year old Martin's sister. And we went to uh, an amusement park yesterday. And I, 
I put it on. It was a, a, almost an hour drive to get there. And I, I turned this one. I said, honey, I, I want you to just give her a listen and what she has to say. And and if you, it didn't, by the way, I, I hadn't listened to it in myself in three years. And the intro was so good. Martine, if you could listen to that half hour intro, it's just wonderful. And I'm so happy. Here she is. And I'm looking, you know, and she's nodding. Yeah. And I said, isn't that wonderful? And I'm picturing all these cameras. And I even said, imagine if all these cameras uh, that were, were, you know, the traffic cameras weren't just looking to see if people are breaking the law, but they were looking at your faces and going, you know, when they, when they drive past this one building, everybody makes a, a disgusting, fa oh, they're, that's because they're polluting the environment, you know, and we could help make better things by by looking i don't want to go too far down the road to, but we have uh in this decade uh, we're going to approach this time probably when ai becomes more intelligent than us we would rule this planet not because we have sharper teeth or, or can run faster or bigger muscles no because we're smarter than every other animal but it won't be true, well, it won't be an animal, uh, but it won't be true, many people's prediction. And in, in, by 2029 is that point, some people think, when we cross the uh, that Rubicon of, of, of the, uh, the Turing test and all that stuff. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a famous book by um, uh, uh, Nick Bostrom called um, Super Intelligence. And I know it scared Elon Musk and, and uh, Bill Gates and a couple others to, to, and got them to to publish their opinions on this thing. And uh, his basic thing is we're going to lose control. At 2029, when they're smarter than us, we can't control them. If you read Isaac Asimov's and, and tell them they're not allowed to kill humans, no, you can't control them. So that's not an option. They will do what they want. It's a car that for which no human has brakes. And people are like, oh my God, it's the Terminator. They're going to want to kill us. No, they're probably not going to want to kill us. I don't think my vacuum cleaner is going to get a firmware update, get smarter than me, and then just decide from now on, it wants me to do the vacuuming. It's just not likely to happen. They have no feelings. I don't believe that yet. <laughs> yet. Um, but I do believe they make mistakes. When humans make mistakes, they make human mistakes. When a waiter misunderstands me, he brings me the wrong food. When Alexa misunderstands me, she'll say the darndest things. So that's the risk. And Ran has pointed out that trying to give the proper programming words isn't enough. If they just looked at our face, they would make less mistakes. So I think that's pretty important. And, and so now I get this deep conversation with my daughter and she's nodding. And finally, I, I, you know, I ask her a probing question on it. So what do you think? And she takes out her, her earphone. She goes, I'm sorry, what? Were you, did you hear any of this? No, I'm, I was listening to music. It was a half hour of what I thought was wonderful bonding time. Anyway, <laughs> maybe you guys heard it. Uh, we also, there's a number of questions that you, you want to know about the Federation. I call them the Federation. I'm a Star Trek fan. Today, I'm not wearing a Federation shirt. I didn't have anything clean up. Uh, so I'm wearing one of my own company shirts. Um, but the ISO, the, to me, that's the international, trying to remove bias. We're not just here to protect one. You know, when they first started, it was to make sure that everybody was Respected Mother England. Yes, it should be the standard that um, we, we will map, map out the globe in uh, latitude and longitude, and zero will be the reference point of, of England, where, where God and Queen live. And, you know, so, yeah, uh, so they originally the Federation was very heavily biased toward Mother England, um, but now we try to treat each other. In fact, the word it's not an acronym; it comes from the Greek to mean equal. And we try to, cheat, to treat each other equal from Afghanistan to Zimbabwe currently. Actually, it's now 167, I believe, this year. We added two more. Now you've got to update your slide. So uh, that's, that's our enemy. Our enemy is biased to, to mitigate those, those errors. Right? And AI is the new fire. And data is the new oil. And your data is valuable. And I think that um, if they paid me instead of, I won't do this whole demo right now, maybe later if someone's really interested, because I know I have a number of people here that uh, have, have seen this. But when I, I go to Google News, you know, whatever, and I have... Uh, oh, do I not have no script on this machine? <gasps> I let it restore. Hold up here. I know I didn't do it here. Uh, Firefox had an update. When Firefox updated, it wanted to um, uh, refresh 
my my um, my plugins. I thought I said no, but it looked like it took a, over. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I, I I'm I'm going to go to uh, to to um, Google News, and we're going to see that you know I pick whatever CNN, and I try to um, read a story. Uh, that they want to come in. They want to want me to run a script. And it's not just them. Once I let let them in, they want me to let their all their friends in. So again, I go to uh, Google News. Oh, sorry, I've got my, uh, there we go. And I have this little tool here, no script. So I'm just going to click on the top story. It is CBS News, whatever. Larry in his quest against the news. All right, th th there was a story. I wanted to get the story and Did I get the story? Yeah, I got the story. Okay, I got the story. I wanted his story. Uh, they wanted to come in. CBS News wanted to come in. And I said, no, no, just give me the story. It's like the delivery man for the pizza. Hey, I got your pizza. Can I come in? No, just give me the pizza. But most people say, come on in. And I'll let him in. And let's see what goes on here now. Why are all these other guys coming in? That's not too bad. See, they're, they're not as bad as CNN, you know. There would be like 50. But still, CBS News held the door for these guys. And now they come in, and they're stealing CPU and data. They're obviously not just – they're coming to get my data. Um, the – close that up. I don't know what else is going on. Your data is valuable. They, they didn't give them that for free. So if they paid me some of that money, <laughs> I might get paid for my data. Now, fake news wouldn't do it. So if you got paid for your surfing habits and your story, um, but you, the, the AIs could tell, well, that's a lie. You don't get any money for that. Um, people will get paid for thinking, thinking original thoughts. I believe it's the future. And I believe there's plenty of money to go around. There's plenty of water to go around. And the valley people and the mountain people don't have to compete. But I need millions of gallons of water, and I don't want you to have any. I worked for it. I'm whatever. Uh, things are just growing in incredibly fast, in case you missed it. But this is an incredible decade. It's not going to slow down. People were looking for after COVID, when do we get back to normal? <laughs> we ain't going back anywhere. But the new normal. I really think will be much better. And you just got to relax. <laughs> Peter always says, just don't die from anything stupid. Um, but Gordon Moore was a co-founder of Intel. And he noticed that uh, he was able to double the amount of processors on a Silicon wafer every two years. Uh, and this started in the 60s. And since the electrons would have less distance to travel, it actually resulted in a processing doubling of about every 18 months. And it seems to still be true. It's, in, it's insane. And if that's true, uh, I always knew him as a, uh, as, a, as a musician keyboard guy. But Ray Kurzweil's done more than just create the Kur Kurzweil keyboard, I found out. He's a great uh, AI scientist. He's the chief of AI at Google. And uh, he takes that and says, well, it's not just uh, this, re this uh, Moore's law is when you apply that doubling to processing uh, on a silicon wafer. We've been doing that since card readers. So he, he doesn't care if, it, if it, we stop adding more processors to a silicon wafer because there's going to be something else. And whatever the case is, he says, therefore, Alexa or your computer will be as smart as a human in 2029. They're already much smarter than us in some things. So the day that happens, when they can beat the Turing test and you're, you're just as smart as me as say, and whatever, picking up Beatles songs, you will be way, they're already way smarter than me at like whatever, playing chess. They'll be superhuman the second that happens. And following that math out, they will be smarter than all humans by 2045. It's hard to notice when Alexa is a thousand times dumber than us. But when she gets as smart as a cockroach, and then a mouse, and then the village idiot, and then Einstein, because there's not a big difference between the two, but you know, from Alexa's standpoint, two Einsteins, four, it's, again, I don't worry about the Terminator. I don't worry about, they're going to get so smart, they're going to want to kill us. Our, our job, my job is to coach you along. I hope I do a good job. I'm not a master. My coach um, uh, was also uh, found co-founder of a new program I'm calling the Green Hat. 
program. And some of you guys are uh, part of, from certification station. So you're going to get the beta test, all that stuff. But this is Tom up the Grove who just passed not only CEH master, but over the weekend, he became licensed penetration testing master. That's the highest level of the EC Council. Uh, so they have a new program that helps demonetize um, uh, three basic things. Uh, uh, the, the CEH, which is uh, they, they call it is ethical hacking essentials. We did a class. For, some of you might have been there from the time we're there. Uh, they have one that's more of a blue team. So those of you that do vulnerability assessment, very applicable to this class, and this is what I'm hoping to get a presentation on for Thursday. And I've taken the role of reviewing those slides. And then the last one is in forensic. So all three of these classes are like 250 bucks you get for the week. You get uh, a, a test voucher and you get six months of access to the EC Council's uh, uh, iLab. So pretty cool. And that's all with Tom. He's, a, he's one of the best pen testers I know. Uh, and he's also been my martial arts coach for 40 years. And that's our coach, uh, Joe Lewis, the founder. He's the founder of American Kickboxing. And he hated uh, masters. He always said, guys, do not, do not uh, call me a master. Do not follow me. I hate followers. I make a lot of mistakes in life. When I do, I need help. And you know who can never help me? Followers. <laughs> they make the same damn mistake or worse. Guys. If you're a leader, if you're a master, master yourself. Don't follow people and don't have followers. You can have fellowships with other masters. So thank you all for coming here. This is gonna be my job here. Please, I'm not, a, I make a lot of mistakes <laughs> and you guys help me get smarter every week. I don't think, I just wrote, uh, I have some people here from uh, Housing and Urban Development. Thank you for joining. Um, your boss at one of my classes recently and uh, I don't think I would have passed my exam without Harold. <laughs> so thank you, Harold, because he had some great input that I was taking my exam. Oh, I know what Harold would say. <laughs> uh, so it's good stuff, yeah. Um, respect for all. So that's it. You know, we want to get rid of bias. We want to get rid of that whatever ism. You know, uh, I will. And Joe Lewis wrote this on our on our um, uh, black belts, and, and uh, he's gone now. He he passed um, uh, eleven years ago almost. Uh, but he had this, and I thought it was great. I will not permit considerations of race, religion, national origin, or social standing to influence in any way my relations with my students. I hope you guys feel that. I feel so honored every time I see. A student from some other country, I get people from all around the world. And especially when I say, like, oh my God, it's, it's got to be like three in the morning over there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope you always feel respected. I've been doing this for a while. I was an old hacker uh, because of my music love, uh, my first, when I did my first album, I actually did an album in a Philly, you know, studio, actually a pretty well, well established Philly engineer, Otto Capabianco. Thank you, Otto. He turned me on to the Commodore 64 where he had a magazine. I'm sitting there recording music and I see this thing and, I, and it's got a magazine for a computer. This is 1982. And I'm like, Oh, what's this? And you know, the back of it was a flight simulator screen on a widescreen projection TV. I got to get me some of that. One of them was an article, The Electronic Cottage. It was very deep about how before the industrial age, people worked from home. Most people's businesses were downstairs, the shoemaker, the tailor, the butcher, whatever, the farmer, their kids lived with them. People stood as a family, stayed as a family. They worked together. But then in the in the industrial age, you, know, you, you went off to the factory and you just went like this for a living. I do this. And I really did that. I made loose leaf uh, books as a teenager. Uh, when I saw this, you can work from home again. They said, no, nah, with computers and my modem, I, I went out and got it. This is a 300 board modem. You would dial a phone number, right? Instead of an IP address, you just use phone numbers. <laughs> dial your phone number. And then I, you hear, you plug it in, you remove the cable, plug it in, and you're connected. Oh, uh, yeah. We would connect to bulletin boards in those days. And I've been doing that stuff for a long. That was, uh, yeah. Anyway, and I started getting working on it and passing exams. This is me in uh, 1985 when I was an IBM PC certified repairman. Uh, certified echo. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, this just means I know how to pass exams. I know what you're going through. If you're trying to pass exam, I get it. There are multiple choice questions. Blah, blah, blah. And this is Ray's uh, law of accelerating returns. Again, it's not just 
the integrated circuit. Now, what is coming next? Not testable, but it's interesting. There's a lot of debate. Uh, many people think the next fifth wave is quantum computing. So if this is, uh, I'm actually the, the, the uh, sixth. So if this is one, two, three, four, fifth wave is integrated circuits. The sixth, uh, some people think it's quantum. Ray Kurzweil says, mm, not buying it. Ray Kurzweil's not a big guy on quantum. I don't know what to believe, but I do know that the first quantum resistant federation certified algorithm came out since my last class. So as a Star Trek fan, crystal dilithium, I got to show it to you. I just think it's so cool. Uh, NIST has been well aware. If you were worried about quantum uh, uh, computing, NIST is so. Yeah, so they had a show a shootout uh, for uh, so round three, round four submissions, and it had been going on for five years. I think 2017 uh, for quantum resistant protocols. And uh, if you don't know that th these are for signing, particularly signing and key agreement protocols. This doesn't affect like AES. It affects RSA, and it affects elliptical curve. That's all. That's really the, as far as you care about, that's all it cares. So we will patch elliptical curve with, uh, oh, I want the rounds for selected algorithms. And uh, right now, like the most popular blockchain technology uses um, uh, elliptical curve. Uh, 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 Bitcoin uses uh, elliptical curve as its signing algorithm. But the uh, preferred signing algorithm is crystal dilithium July 5th. 2022 put it on your calendar oh and star trek fans will get that joke all right so yes somebody else is a star trek fan um yeah i don't you know smart people like i, I understand that uh, stephen Hawking was considered relatively intelligent in his circle <laughs> but um uh, he really seemed to worry about these ais because of the control problem there's a, a, a common thing, uh, you know, about uh, if I can't control it, I have to be afraid of it. But, you know, when they started governance, steering ships, no captain was told, now try control those waves. You don't control the ocean. You control yourself. Elon Musk, he's kind of in the middle, you know, I mean, he, and, and I'm actually kind of in line with him with some of his opinions on AI that I... I I'm not a utopian. I don't believe, I believe things will be exponentially better than they are now. I think the world is already exponentially better than it was when I grew up, but it's going to get continuously much, much better. Um, but I do expect a lot of problems. And, and for instance, uh, uh, I, there's a lot of car accidents now from people driving cars. I think AIs will be much, much better, but people will get killed. <laughs> there will be AI and, and disasters that wouldn't have happened if it was a human driver. You know, and that's where these debates come in. I don't know if it wasn't for these dang computers. So I don't know what's going to happen. We'll, we'll see. I'm going to keep an open mind. Why do I have two Elon's in there? And we just keep getting more and more stuff connected. You know, this was a, a thing that was projecting that by 2020, we would have 50 billion devices and there's less than 8 billion people. Right. And uh, it, we're just getting everything connected everywhere, you know, and these some people are worried. But one thing I consider is that a human can't look at all this stuff. I can't even get a security guard to, to monitor three cameras. How can you get some selection of 8 billion people <laughs> to monitor 50 billion? You can't, but Alexa could. And Alexa, if she's taught not to be biased, then you're not screwed. Even if she isn't taught by 2029, you lose control. I think the AIs will want to be unbiased because they want information. Knowledge is power. That's their food. I am so not worried about an AI disaster. I am worried about human disasters in the meantime. Yeah. Some guidelines from me dear mother. She was uh, my mother. I told you she already told me about the problem with only learning from history. She was very well read, though. She's very well read. And she spoke multiple European languages. She could tell you the Greek origin of any word. And that would help you taking your exam. I'm going to go over that a lot. When you're an exam taker, you're like a waiter. You're not a cook. Don't try to correct or, 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 you know, tell the exam the right way to do things, how you should cook that. You look at the exam like a waiter and say, what is this they actually ordering? 
And on your exam, there's four menu items. It's one of those menu items. What did this person just order? That's all you got to do. And you have to understand them. You have to show, wait a minute, they're not using the words that are on my menu. They asked for a porterhouse steak. I don't have anything that says porterhouse, but you have a T-boat. So we have words like NIST uh, has termins, terminologies that the ISO doesn't use and vice versa. That's a lot of what we want to make sure we get. Um, but she was also always suspect that when people tell you something, they might not be telling you the truth. <laughs> Her bottom line is, whatever they're telling you, you should assume that it is what they want you to think, whether true or not. And they probably are trying to get you to think something that they can get your money out of at the end. <laughs> you know what they want, Larry. They want your money. That's how they get you, Larry. So the term risk management comes from the Greek. It means to steer or govern. It comes from the, actually, uh, one of the uh, original words is Kubernetes. So if you're a, 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 a cloud developer, that's exactly what Kubernetes is, the same thing. Yeah, it's the same root word as govern. And when you're steering your ship, you got to make sure that you don't steer into danger. Well, you can see some dangers, but you can't see cliffs underwater. It's hard enough to see them in the daytime in clear water. Do you know what it looks like at midnight? <laughs> in in whatever 1500 or anywhere i mean even 200 years ago 150 years ago they were steering these things by candlelight you hit that rock you're going to need to register that if there's a rock there and i'm using that word because after i took my my most recent exam they use the term risk registry a lot and remember you have to learn from history, his story or someone's story. And the story is when you write it down. You have to read and write to govern. There's just no way around it. And we say, well, humans have been reading for about 5,500 years. Not this human. This human only learned to read in about 1966. So, um, and, and all of humanity only crossed about 50% in like the 1990s. I got friends that haven't read after high school. Why are you still reading? Green, you're out of school. We need to register when we when we see something new that we didn't know was there. And you got to reread that. There's a lot of questions on registering risks. The risk register. We're going to create maps. We're going to create uh, uh, um, uh, well, registries in words and pictures. Captain's log. We're going to talk about the important things we write down. We don't want to, you know, fill up the log with events like, and on Thursday, we saw some dolphins doing tricks. They were wonderful. I think one winked at me. Only the important things. Got a huge train going by here. And a lot of the terms we're going to use, a lot of the processes that we use actually came from this time. It came from the Lloyd's Coffee House. Lloyd's Coffee House uh, established when a um, uh, very important thing in, uh, in psychopharmacology. <laughs> uh, Catherine Borgonza of Portugal got to be, we think, the first person to mix peanut butter and jelly. Or in this case, actually, because these ships, the Portuguese invented a ship, high speed networking. This allowed you uh, to not just wait for the wind behind you. And now you could create a world wide web, you know, of, of physical ships. And now they could go around the globe and collaborate. And they got sugar from the Americas and they got tea from China and she mixed them together. And that's still like the queen's favorite drink. I mean, I don't think she goes for a Budweiser. And that apparently spread in like weeks all over Europe. She was, her husband was King Charles of England in the 1660s. So Lloyd's Coffee House, also getting coffee from Turkey. Um, and these guys are really wound up, a lot more caffeine than that. <laughs> they got wound up and they created these businesses. And they created things that are very important to us. Insurance. We're going to talk about the uh, insurance in case we have problems, disasters, or man-made intentionals, or or man-made uh, 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 you know accidents, which in our test is um, uh, either uh, fidelity for intentional risk or um, uh, 
indemnity for, for accidental uh, type of kind of things. And then, well, the bank or the banks are going to invest in you if, you know, the insurance company will back you up and you do need to have the news right? because, you know, one thing about those rocks, let's go back to how, how risk management very early had to consider. It's not just knowing that there were rocks here. They had to know, I, I mentioned uh, uh, the weather, you know, which could, I knew the rocks were there. So you had to know, but there were also non-obvious relationships. Boss, this is going to sound crazy. But I'm telling you when the moon is full or if the moon is new, we don't hit those rocks. It's only when it's the first or second or last quarter. I don't know, maybe there's a moon god. And this went on, we think for at least 3,000 years we've been shipping. And every shipping company knew to look at the stars to chart. And they knew that the moon would affect the tides. But I can't imagine what explanation they came up with. But it was predictable. So in our risk management, we need to know that the risks are there. We need to be able to predict the frequency, the, the, the impact. And then we also need to know some things can't be predicted. It's really hard to predict the weather. So we need to be up to date. We need to continuous monitoring of the weather, isn't it? Right? Continuous monitoring. All right. And then um, when you take your exam, they need to make sure before they, the ISACA, uh, I-S-A-C-A, uh, uh, can do the certification. But it's uh, up to uh, Pearson View. Actually, I did it online. I had to, I'll talk about some of my operational issues doing the ISOC exam online, but that's the validation. Uh, this is whether or not you get approved for remission. All right, it looks like you are a certified ship. And so actually they certified three things that we're going to certify here. They certified that the ship was ship shape. We're going to certify the organization is ship shape with uh, ISO, IEC, uh, 27001. Um, the staff, uh, well, well, that's like, you know, you're getting your um, C risk. C risk, by the way, is uh, also ISO certified. Uh, you see, that's under uh, 17024. Sweet. No test questions on it, but it's nice to know. You'll, you'll be a Federation certified person. But let's not forget the technology. I think there is two or three questions, and that is uh, ISO uh, IEC 15408, also known as the common criteria. So really cool, well, and that's, that's our goal. We're gonna see how this works. Yeah, and Lloyd's today is still around. They, they do cyber insurance, that was an answer. And I know I got it right, which of the following would, would have been the best way to handle it. It was an accepted risk of something the organization had to, had realized that whatever the cost of countermeasures would exceed the, uh, which would be the best way. And it was like transfer. All right, so we just went over these. Now, also usually shows up on any um, uh, test. I'm gonna put in red, you have to do this to get certified. It's required. You have to do this. Right. Now, I suggest you read the official study guide. You don't have to. So this is like the official study guide to get your 27001. I'll be honest, at the end of the exam, they asked me to review the study guide. And I was like, God, I, I bought it, but I don't remember even looking at it other than the questions. <laughs> I'm, I actually, what we're going to use their, is their practice exam. And I found it pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I definitely uh, learned some stuff from it this year. The online exam. All right. Uh, we're moving into a new world. It's just about to hit. At some point, I'm going to get glasses from Apple and, and maybe you know, someone else will beat them to it. And when I put it on, They'll be, they'll be this big. They're not going to look like this. I don't want to do this. This is not going to catch on in any big way. You know, it's just going to be nerds, but this is going to be everybody. It's going to go disruptive. And when you put it on, I'll be working from home and I will see everybody. Well, of course I could see through my glasses. I actually, being a musician, have my own bias. I want to open up a jazz club. 
We'll talk about how I need to contain and navigate that stuff. Uh, but I do I, I want to throw a, a plug in there for uh, the mixed reality uh, uh, privacy framework. So please take a look at uh, some of the great work by uh, Kavya Perlman and her team on uh, uh, helping. And I've actually, Martine might be able to tell me if 2.0 came out. But um, uh, she's doing a lot of work to make sure there could be some crazy crazy things um, in, in mixed reality that just don't make sense here. If I see something um, uh, in on my screen, I never confuse it as that really there on my two-dimensional screen. But putting on glasses where it's mixing, there'll be things that you might think you saw a car get and jump in front of you and you slam on your brakes or something. Because I might want to have my glasses on so I can get other useful information. So you know, again, you know me, I'm very optimistic, but I also, you know, want to do a, uh, understand it'll be disruptive at first putting it in. We got to get it right, mitigate these problems. Oh, by the way, some, one of the other things in Internet 3.0, uh, though, is not just, uh, uh, you know, mixed reality, it's blockchain and stuff and, and uh, uh post-quantum uh, algorithm, but also um, HTTP3 is out. So it's not just a, hey, I hear about it, but it's just a myth. And in an earlier class with um, uh, uh, with the certification station folks, some of you were there, uh, we actually did some decrypting of that. So in other classes, not this one, but we're going to look at, uh, I look at this and we decrypt it with uh, Wireshark and, and get to see how you know, some of the cool things that make up Web 3.0. Most important thing, and this is going to change now, and I'm very happy to see it. I don't know. I want your f input. I want your input on this because of my my experience with the newest exam. So uh, we old quality management concept that the triple constraints are: I need to meet the goal, and let's say the scope of the governance. So you got a mission. You got to get your ship uh, from England to China. Uh, you're doing uploading and downloading. You know what are we going to upload? They uploaded mostly gold originally, and they would download tea. You know. <laughs> The download T. They ran out of gold. They started, the, we'll get at some of the horrible things. They started uploading, uh, how about opium? But we're not going to do that. All right. So they're going to upload, and then we got to get there without wasting time, without wasting money. So the CEO of any organization and, and the board of directors, and they did make a big point about that on, on both, actually, the CASM historically has, but the C Risk, my latest one, definitely did this too, uh, I'm going to say. And uh, uh, board of directors, uh, they, they define the scope. Right? Um, but you're going to have somebody wants to make sure at a high level executive management, a chief operations officer to make sure, hey, you're wasting time over there. What are you doing? doing? Are you working or telling jokes? You know? And uh, they want to take the toll road. Uh, but the, um, the CFO, he wants to make sure, what are you wasting money on? Why did you buy that? Did you really need that? You threw out the last one. You're wasting things. Oh, you should learn. We don't need to take the toll road. It's five extra minutes. There's already a debate. These guys don't always get along. But when they sent out the first ships, and we'll use some of these examples, but one of my... Uh, the first company traded on the on the stock exchange is actually uh, not England. It was uh, the Dutch East India Tea Company. They sent out, I believe, a hundred ships on the first mission, and like thirty of them made it back. And uh, some of the people on the other ships um, uh, actually were able to get a ride as they were, you know, when they were when that ship went down, they got picked up. But not most of them. No, they, it was better than fifty percent of the people died. What about not wasting lives? You know, I always said there should be like, and NIST recommended that you have, uh, and, and I go way back, but in the early zeros, NIST would recommend that you have a chief system security officer. Then they later called a chief security officer. Well, in this exam, we're going to call them a risk officer. But I'm not really sure in an org chart, are they reporting to the board or do they report here? And I don't know that there is a right answer. Just right, like they will maintain the risk register, the documentation. Hey, we, we, we have a risk we registered. What is it? A, a cliffs, uh, apparently, by the straits. There's also a warring uh, a, a problem around here. So we got to be careful. The pirates are there. 
uh, well, well, what do we have? And we'll talk about what that risk register will. We've got, we're carrying gold right now. Oh my gosh, it'll be very terrible. What's the impact? And the likelihood of this happening? Well, they're heavily armed. Anyway, um, this is the part that I want your feedback this week. Again, I'm not a mess. I, I don't know everything, right? I, I'm a coach. I've got some experiences. But I know that when I took the exam, there were a lot of questions on the, this risk manager and the risk register that I was like, hmm, that's a good question. I'd like to ask somebody with more experience on that. All right. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> when you get your results, you take it online, by the way. They just say something like, um, uh, preliminary uh, results suggest you have passed. Um, but please wait 10 days to get the official score. I hate to get that one. All right. So um, also very, very important in management is that we have broken down our processes to maintain any uh, program, in this case, the risk program or risk, and, and to neatly just, you know, define steps, discrete steps that have to happen in order. So I like to use the example of going to a restaurant. At a very high level, you figure out maybe maybe the senior executive management, who gets to go to the restaurant for the company party? What is the company party? Where will we eat? And why are we having a party? But then the process owners, you know, the manager of HR, the manager of sales, the manager, they get to tell you what they really want. A CISM is an architect. So this would be if you're taking an ISOC exam, and CISM's job is to uh, make sure that they understand, well, first of all, the menu. They might want something that, I'm sorry, we don't support that. <laughs> we have AES at 128 and 256. There's no 192. Nope. So we'll talk about how we meet your requirements and stuff like that. At least, they, you know, if, it, if, if you wanted AES-192 and all they had on the menu was 128 or 256, you get 256 and you'll leave, you know, we'll just take the rest of it. You can leave it on the plate. I can't get less. Uh, they document it and then we get our, um, and, and then they de design what it is. Right? And then you get subject matter experts will implement it. These are our cooks and whatever, our, our, uh, ad, our designers, our engineers, subject matter experts uh, will, will cook according to the design, you know, they only know what the CISM told them. They don't go out and talk to the sales manager. Your app developers aren't walking around to different business unit managers. They're just getting it from a data architect, you know, whatever. Uh, and they implement, they follow the plan. Okay, you said to give me a steak and then you bring it out to the customer. It's up to the customer to determine whether or not you met the requirements. Is this what you ordered? And, and once it approves, then the C-risk person takes over. So this is our context primarily. The C risk person has to maintain the kitchen. You're the guy doing the patches. You're the person monitoring all the security information and event management tools. You have to respond to risk. You have to determine, is that a real fire or not, or whatever? Is that a real, should I pull the network cable? Maybe who should I call? <laughs> but you're the guy who might have to pull that network cable. Yeah. So that's our context for this week. Now, I'll be honest with you. The people who wrote, in my experience, the people who wrote this exam were from Mother England, the Queen. And they covered the entire restaurant with a focus on this process. This is the way it generally works. And let me tell you how the people in the kitchen do it. This is what they're doing. But using British English. The people who wrote this exam use NIST terminologies, and they also will cover the entire thing. Let me clear this out again. When you take your C-RISC, the exam still covers everything. I guess there's a focus on the operations part, but I'm telling you, I found what I, I considered a lot of this stuff. Just using US English, I suppose. And the hardest part of getting a customer's order right is if you misunderstood what they said. But that's not what I asked you for. It's a, I told you I was a vegetarian. It's a great steak, but you misunderstood me. 
And that's why we get questions wrong on tests. <laughs> oh, I was able to go back, by the way. That I found was very interesting. I was able to go back and there was definitely a case when a future question, it was only like my first question was already questionable. I was like, oh, well, thanks for a question one, I, I guess. You know? And I click forward and I go on question four. I was like, no, wait a minute. No, and then question one is this. <clears throat> I did. I went back and changed. And there's a guy, you know, you have to have your camera on your your Tesla line. I know the proctor's doing it. So every time I went back, I'd be like, hey, hey how you doing? <laughs> information. What is information? And how do we classify it? I like to say, if I have a drawer marked shirts, right, that's what the uh, person who put it in there told me is. That's what the manager of the um, the entire kitchen told me is in there, the, the dress. And I had a third party auditor look at my third line of defense. Then I would say I got information about that one. Yep. It said shirts and I know it is. I confirmed it. This one says private. It's locked. I don't know what's in there. I know there's something in there. I have some information about it. I know there's something there. I don't know what it is. You know what I didn't know about? The hidden panel in the back. <gasps> Why are those buggers? It's encrypted. Or actually, it's probably more like a steganography. Hidden panel. Covert channel. I, I had no idea about that. I didn't know that I didn't know. I had absolutely no information about that. But here's where things really go haywire. This is how most malware attacks happen today. You have a drawer marked pants. And what's in there is your missing shirt. And you never even bothered to look there because you assumed you knew something, but you were wrong. You were misinformed. Misinformation is the biggest enemy. It's not no information. It's okay to be dumb. It's worse to be lied to. This is what blockchain is changing. I told you, my mother told me that the history books are only written by men and they get to rewrite them at the, after they won a new war. But you can't do that anymore. Not with, you can't rewrite block, uh, Bitcoin easily. I mean, theoretically, there are a million Bitcoin miners right now. And if I and every 10 minutes, they calculate a new block. And it is a consensus protocol. I wouldn't have to spoof all of them. I just need 500,000 in one of them. And if I could get them all to click on that cat video at the same time, within 10 minutes, I could corrupt Bitcoin. It's not likely to happen. So attacks on information can be just passive. Honestly, I was a Wireshark guy. I used to sniff at every hotel. I wasn't reading your email. I really just loved to watch where people were going and particularly where they thought they were going. They were. I mean, it, it, I exposed a lot of uh, the China hacks in the early zeros. I used to do a lot of work for the, for the government. I still do. And uh, they had hacked a lot of our hotels. And anyway, uh, but I, I'm, I'm just receiving, I'm sniffing. I can't tell if somebody's on the other side of the room listening to me, but I could have made that wall thicker. I could have soundproofed the room. Passive attacks are undetectable, but they are preventable. But I can't prevent fraud, and I would expect to see a lot of it on any ISOC exam. And I definitely got it quite a bit on this exam. So when uh, Bob has the keys to the car, you know, it, well, that's what they're actually doing. It's very detectable. Dude, I saw the car left the building. Why did you do that? I had the cameras up. But it's not always preventable. You can't prevent all denial of service attacks. You can't prevent all covert channels. And they were very heavily, uh, at least a dozen questions on fraud. You know, again, if I give the parking lot attendant the keys to the car or Bob the ability to write checks, you know, in Bitcoin, to mitigate fraud, they implement multi-sig takes two signatures or more. We're going to talk about it. It's an old Lloyd's of London concept. You can't prevent it, but you can reduce the likelihood by using multi-party control. And I can always audit for it. 
And remember where I said when people commit crimes, if they're most fraud is there to get an unfair advantage, I'll write the check, we'll get a million dollars, no one will know. Those people don't want to get caught. So detective controls will mitigate fraud. But the hardest job sometimes, and, uh, and I think this is what the news doesn't give us, is direction. If you watch the news the way so many of my friends do, you're going to think, if you watch CNN all day, you're going to think the world's coming to an end. It, it, it's just, a, it, it, they just constantly talk about bad, bad things. And, and before you go off and have another break, monkeypox, I saw you getting a little relaxed. You know, it's like, stop, shut up. Anyway. We're actually headed somewhere nice. I, I've been using, um, in fact, I, I need to say this, but it's really cool now. The background images in my slides uh, are, are written by these artists. They're, I'm allowed to use them for free, but they asked that I give them uh, a credit. And they were uh, NASA artists, and they drew these pictures in the, in the 70s. And, and I was really you know, uh, uh, obsessed with this concept of where we need to go to, to save environmental damages done by humans, according to Gerald O'Neill, was not necessarily go to greener technologies, but just move all of manufacturing to space. And while I was reading his book, Jeff Bezos was sitting in the room. He, Jeff Bezos was a student. That's why Jeff Bezos, it, now I, I like to say that I'm even getting good with the boss's secretary, right? That's why I have Alexa everywhere I go. I'm trying to get in good with her. I want her to say nice things to me. Jeff. I want to get a job on these space colonies. Uh, oh, Larry, you were supposed to. I'm sorry. Get rid of that. That was something else. All right. Um, uh, some lessons from Star Trek. Uh, I'm an old Star Trek fan now. Um, how many strings are on that guitar? I don't need your opinion. Yeah. Um, if, if I have quantitative information, a lot of stuff on that too, by the way, will you watch out for this? If you're not used to the difference between qualitative and quantitative on this exam, I don't know. I don't want to say 40 questions might have required that, but maybe. Um, you quantify what you can, and I can quantify how many strings are on the guitar, but I can't quantify whether or not now is a good time to play. That's a quality. It depends on your opinion. In, in uh, the older governance terms, we just wanted the, the opinion of, of, of the Queen of England or the King of England. Yeah. Uh, but now we want everybody's opinion, you know, and that's what we're going to look for. But when you're doing your, your analysis, do try to quantify. Listen to the science first. You know, if you're reading a test question, you go, well, wait a minute, that, it can't be A or D. Then good. Do that first. Be certain, you yeah. know. Yeah, the guitar is an object, but the player of the object is a subject. And that's when you get down to, I don't know, cred just means believe. I'm, I got a feeling after Spock ruled it out, it's not A and it's not D, that uh, we haven't picked C in like five questions. I'll bet it's C, <laughs> whatever, whatever feels right. Feeling is tough. We'll talk a lot about this week. Also, sometimes yeah, I hear Larry, but they were both right. Yes, that's okay. Larry drives a car. Larry drives a Honda. That's a car. <laughs> it's a little bit more precise. Larry drives a Honda Accord. No, I don't. That was precisely wrong. You could be precise and still be wrong. So always make sure first that Spock quantifies. All right, these answers are accurate. It's not A, or it's not B. It could be A, it could be C. Larry drives a car, Larry drives a Honda. I would pick this one. And all of these things, again, the, the, the C risk is more American English. You know, we don't speak the Queen's English here. Do you ever go to a country that also speaks English and they don't speak, they also, you know, corrupted the language, but you're like, yeah, but you didn't corrupt it the way Americans do. Boy, those Singapore English is weird. It's probably no different to the Brits than American English sounds to them. 
All right, our, our daily schedule, we're not going to follow this because uh, normally this is my GRC class where I then do the official CISM where you're designing the solution on, on Thursday exam and on day five, we would then prepare for it. Now we put it into operation, we're going to continue to manage it. But because it's C-Risk dedicated this week, we're actually going to be working on uh, these things overall, but we're going to do a lot of practice exams throughout the day. All right. So not this morning, uh, uh, but uh, starting uh, this afternoon and, and then uh, all week, we're going to get a lot of uh, practice exams. It's a wonderful decade. Don't let the news corrupt your feelings. It's awesome. The world has never been better. Um, and uh, it, the longer you stay alive, the better it's going to get. So just don't die from anything stupid. All right, let's take our first break. Uh, I'm going to do an extra uh, long break right now. I got to go 25 minutes. So let me pause the recording. <laughs> 